Okay, let's get right back to this. I have rested up my voice, and I am ready to continue talking about some Ace Attorney. Uh, this time around is probably going to be mostly focused on the Investigations games, since uh, they kind of need to be done together, and I also don't want to do the entire sequel trilogy right this instant, because that's also a lot of cases. Like, that's... That's a lot of cases. Uh, but... <clears throat> For now, we'll do the Investigations games. Uh, these are interesting games. They are definitely the most different gameplay-wise of any game in the main series. Or any, any, any Ace Attorney game, rather. Not they're, they're the most different from the main series games, rather. No real... Like, you have t uh, testimonies and cross-examinations in a sense and all that, but you're not doing you're not really having any trials you're just investigating and putting together pieces in your head with the logic system and uh the first case in investigations one uh is, is the good old trope of you know who the killer is to begin with uh and the crime scene is edward's office which is a pretty interesting location to have a crime scene considering how often we've seen it in the original trilogy but as for like uh this is kind of just an overview of the original, the first Investigations game. It's it's fine. It's probably the weakest game in the series. Like maybe Apollo Justice is weaker. Uh, I, they're they're close. I don't really think any case in Edgeworth One is that strong or that engaging. But uh, this this these game these cases they're fine for the most part. Like this is a this is a good introduction to all the mechanics. It's it's very novel to play as Edgeworth investigating a crime scene, having Gumshoe as your partner. <coughs> it's not a surprising mystery because you already know the uh, you already know who did it in advance. And again, since uh, I forget if you're accused of the crime or if uh, Maggie Bird, who was also there again, was accused of it. I, I genuinely can't remember who the defendant in this was, uh, but yeah, it's, it's mostly just a tutorial for the Investigations games as a whole. It's not too terribly long, and it's not too terribly deep. Uh, yeah, there's really not a lot to say about this case, honestly. Like, it's it's fine. I, I'd put it about here. Maybe I could be convinced to swap these two. Uh... Investigations to then, uh, the plane case. The case on a plane. This is, it's a more interesting setting than just, uh, having everything happen in one office room, and, uh, you do get a lot more in-depth investigation going on here. Though, again, it's not, like, super memorable. This is, like, every case in this game does tie into, like, an overarching story. Like, that's the thing they're going to repeat for pretty much every single Ace Attorney game from here on out after Trials and Tribulations did it so well, and the overarching story in this game isn't exceptionally good, or in, or really that satisfying, but this is like the first glimpses into it with the smuggling ring. And, yeah, the... The murderer, I believe, is the bubble lady who blows bubbles, and she, she's part of the smuggling ring, and uh, they were smuggling this statue on the plane, which also is a very, very big plane to have a cargo bay like that, I gotta say. Like, it's, it's weird how big this plane is to be. I, that's, it's, I digress. Like, uh, you know, one thing I'm gonna admit with a lot of Investigations 1 cases that I just don't tend to remember a lot of the details that well because I don't find them that interesting. Uh, <clears throat> I'd, say, I'd say this is marginally better than the first case because it's got a bit more going on, but there's, there's really not that much to return to. It's I, I do like 1-3 enough to keep it above both of these. Like, they're, they're fine cases. Uh, Investigations 3. This one's weird. Like, this is this is the first one in the game that feels too long. It's not the last, but... 
it definitely does wear out its welcome by the end. Uh, is it, a lot of this case is fan service, it feels like, because uh, an entire Blue Badger theme park, for one, uh, it brings back a lot of characters like uh, Emma Sky and Mike Meekins, the water of which, yeah, fan service, uh, I use that uh, very tentatively. It's you know, fan service bring back Mike Meekins, yeah, sure, okay. But also, on the subject of fan service, it does have like one of the funniest moments of the game, with the pink badger's reveal of being with the old bag, just the way it's handled, as if it's like this life-shattering revelation, and Edgar's appropriate reaction. I think I thought that was really funny. Like that's the most memorable thing about this entire case for me, honestly, is that reveal. Like I, when I replayed this the first time, I gen genuinely forgot who the murderer was, because it's uh, it's just the murderer is the kidnapping victim who was never actually kidnapped and uh the whole thing is just a setup to get money 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 this does introduce a lot of the main characters in investigations one for as little as that means considering well i know i guess i think shi long lang and sheena were in the plane case too i don't remember them that well though but it does introduce uh kay faraday who is very enjoyable her, sto her story kind of doesn't last very long in these games, unfortunately, because uh, she gets introduced in this case, and then her entire backstory is the next case after, and she doesn't really have much to do after that other than tag along with Edgeworth, which is interesting and kind of weird, but eh. Uh, yeah, so this case, though, it goes it goes on really long. It's I think it's the first... You get the... Hol the little thief like holographic projections for the first time in this case and like logically it's very interesting but a, a lot of the issue with Edgeworth 1 is that like they make interesting mysteries but they don't really make interesting dramas because you don't have uh trials you don't have that like high intensity atmosphere most of the time so it's, it's just a long string of events happening that eventually reaches a conclusion and like this is like the case most uh representative of that in the investigations games i feel like this the stakes aren't very high the mysteries are interesting but not like that compelling and the drama is just not there like i would say this doesn't irk me in the way that uh 3 3 does but it is the weakest case in the game and that's again case three curse one uh investigations four This is an interesting one because it's a flashback case. Flashback cases always tend to be interesting, unsurprisingly. Is that the case itself is a, also interesting, like as a double murder in the one in the defendant rooms. Like it takes place at the court you usually uh, are holding trials at, and the judge is a witness, which is incredible. He's, he's like, I remember he was like super excited about giving testimony and being <coughs> uh, presented evidence and objections. It's, it's really funny. <laughs> like the, the judge is like, the judge is always just there and he's just minding his own business and getting him, getting to see him outside of like his judge position is really interesting. And also I just, uh, Calista Yu is such a fun villain. Like her attitude towards everything, her laughing is very memorable probably the most memorable part about her character and having having uh young francisca and younger edgeworth and manfred von karma there as well as Kay faraday it's a very nice case uh i will say like with most edgeworth games i don't tend to remember the crux of the mysteries that much except for who the killer and victim were like the, the victim in this case, I believe, well, one of them at least was uh, Kay's father, who was tied. It ties into the Adagarasu thing, where uh, she thought her father was the Adagarasu and she took after him. So, but uh, it turns out that the Adagarasu was actually three people all along, and I think that does come out in this trial, or no, maybe that comes out in, in one five. No, it, it definitely comes out in one five, not this trial, I think. I, I can't remember exactly, but I know I know that's like the big mystery surrounding the game is the Yadagarasu as well as the smuggling ring. And having, having the reveal be that uh, 
Kay's father was not the only one in the attic house. It was pretty interesting. And this, the setting makes it novel enough that it holds it above the rest of the uh, investigations cases, but not by that much. But it should be here. Please, please, okay. Right about here feels about right for it. I, it's probably the best case in the game, which is spoilers for the, how I feel about this next one. But uh, Investigations 1 is just not very exciting in the game. Let's be real. Like, if I, if I say every Ace Attorney game is good, but this is probably the least good. It has the least highest highs and the least replay value. And no case do I want to replay less than Investigations Case 5. Because this starts out really promising. And for a time, it's a really good case with some really good reveals. Like, I, I do like how Shida was all along Callisto Yu after her escape in Investigations 4. Like, I don't think it was super well breadcrumbed throughout the rest of the game, but the lead up to it in the reveal here is really cool and having her animation turn into the laughing animation at the end is also just really funny like ah she can't she can't help herself from laughing like the bastard she is but beyond that again most of the mystery evades my memory it's something to do with the two buildings and like <clears throat> A pulley system between them or something where the, the there were like two bodies and they switched places in the each of the buildings and the mastermind behind it all was this boring old guy who takes like two hours to testify and break down at all and like everything up to the point where you reveal that Shina was close to you is really good and then after that like You've already broken the big mystery, and you've just got this boring old guy who just won't give up. He has nothing to do with the rest of the story except for being the head of the smuggling ring. Which, okay, yeah, the smuggling ring is a big deal, but, like, a big deal in the story. But beyond that, you don't really get much out of it. I, I just, it's not a very, as far as overarching stories in the series go, it's not one of the better ones. I don't know, like... And by this point in the game, too, the novelty of playing as Edgeworth, putting together things with logic, has definitely worn off, so you're, you're just another investigator doing investigating things. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. Like, again, this one's fine. I'd say it's probably better than 1-3 just for its reveals. I could be convinced to put it here, but I'm gonna leave it here for now. So that's that's basically it for the first investigations game, which is it's a fine game. It's like I said, it's it's got the least highest highs, considering its best case is worse than every single case in Trials and Tribulations, and also worse than like a two hour long introduction case in the first game. But I don't have anything against this game. I don't think its lows are that low either. Like. Even its worst case is just mediocre. Far from the worst case in the series, not even worse than... Well, I guess not, I'm saying it now, like, I said every case was worse than Trials and Tribulations. I forget 3-3 three, three exists, yeah. <clears throat> it doesn't have the lowest lows, it's not doesn't have the worst case in the series by far. Like, it's got the best mediocre case, probably, too. Like, I don't have anything against... Uh, Investigations 3, it's just not that good. <clears throat> Thankfully, every single problem I have with the first Investigations game, like the lack of a compelling overarching story, like the lack of drama, the lack of high points, the lack of really that compelling characters, is in instantly fixed by Investigations 2, which just like... How, how do you... Investigations 2 is, in my mind, the fourth game in the original Ace Attorney trilogy because of what it represents and what its ramifications are for uh, the original trilogy story. Like, shove off, shove out all the spirit channel and stuff. Just focus on, like, the legal stuff with uh, Edgeware from Manfred Von Karma and all that. 
And it plays an important role in that, like, the, the first three games can serve as a self-contained story on their own, but what happens in uh, Investigations 2 is, like, the s nerves running throughout that game's uh, skeleton, To I guess to say. Like, it's not the one, it's not building the foundation, but it's uh, building onto what already exists and supplementing it in really interesting ways. It doesn't uh, negate or change the meaning of the original games, but it does give them more context. It has its own satisfying payoff at the end as a result. I just, I like this game a lot. Like, if I would say Trials and Tribulations is the best game in the series, which I still think is correct, uh, this is probably the second best in the entire series, and... It doesn't even have a weak case to its name, I would say. Like, uh, we'll get to it, but I do think the second case here is the weakest case, and it's probably better than any case in uh, the first game. So, yeah, th but the first case here, though, the the first case here starts off with a bang. You are investigating a presidential assassination, which is already far and above the stakes of case one in the first game, where you're just investigating some murder in office like the, the attempted assassination that led to uh the rope guy's death and his uh partner bodyguard being the uh, culprit is not like a huge surprise considering there's only a few characters who could really be involved here but like the way the story unfolds throughout is uh really engaging where you, you start just investigating in the crowd you find out you find the reporter character, and Shelly the killer of all people is there too. So you're immediately suspect of him as the person who uh, attempted the assassination. Uh, but it turns out it was not him. In fact, the assassination was staged. And you get up on stage, you get into the president's airplane, you speak with the president, you find out that he is uh, incredibly bad. He's like, he's not, not bad, he's like uh, an incredible coward. Like he puts on this rough, tough persona, but deep down he's just like this chubby, scared loser who had to fake his own assassination for uh, sympathy and uh, that uh, Knightley took advantage of that to kill Rook. Uh, there's some, I, re I don't remember the specifics of why, I'm, I'm sure, I know it ties into the overarching plot in some way. Like, again, a lot of the minute details escape me, but the fact that I can remember so much more of what happens in this game compared to any of the cases in the first Investigations game speaks wonders to me, and that, like, the drama of this case is a lot more extreme than it was in Investigations 1. A lot, it's a lot longer, too. Like, this is a, this case is probably longer than the first two cases in Investigations one combined by itself. Like it's it's an intro case, but it's a full on like several part mystery that has a satisfying uh, build and payoff to it, and it's deeply tied to the events of the rest of the game following it too. So yeah, like I don't, it's not like amazing, incredible, best case ever material, but it is very good still. So. And it, it's uh, what what it sets in motion across the rest of the game is also very interesting to see because every character in this case, barring I think the killer, comes back at a later point somewhere in the game. Like uh, for example, in uh, case two, uh, the the murderer of the culprit of case one is the victim in this case. And that just uh, starts off a whole chain of events in the prison where this is another case that's also got a lot of fan service, but like in a way that makes sense to an extent, like, I mean, every, every fan service is going to feel like the force to some extent, especially considering that it's implied that a lot of the murder culprits are to be put to death for murder like it's, it's definitely implied at least in some of the earlier games 
but you see uh, Frank Sod, for example, here, alive and well, as well as the the blind dog guy. I think his name is just like Doggin or something, Dogen, one of those, who's set up as a really clever, uh, a really clever uh, red herring villain. Where you think this obviously evil guy who lurks in the shadows and has a dog that goes around and killing people as his murder weapon. Hmm. I just realized. Huh. That's interesting, isn't it? Huh. Well, that has something to do with uh, the Great Ace Attorney. We'll get to that later. But that's interesting. I did not. I did not consider that at the time. That games with dog murderers uh, do not get localized right away. Apparently, interesting. And. Okay, well anyways, yeah, Dogit, as a, as a red herring killer, he's really interesting because he is intimately related to a lot of the case, uh, events that go on in the game. I think he does show up later eventually, too. Uh, can't remember. Like, there's, there's a lot that goes on in this game. There is so much that goes on in this game that it's hard to keep all of it straight, especially towards the end. <clears throat> but yeah, like, uh, then, so you, you got the... You got uh, Frank Sawit as one of the inmates in the prison, but you also got the circus back. Uh, though the only characters you see, I believe, are Regida and the new guy, Simon, who is your defendant in this case, who is a close friend of Knightley's, who has no reason to murder him, but obviously the law doesn't care. Uh... Yeah, I don't think any of the other circus comes back except for Regina, though. But even having her back, having the circus back, like... It's a, it's a callback to a case that nobody liked, and I kind of appreciate the boldness of that. Though, I, my understanding is that 2-3 actually went over a lot better in Japan. Like, they have a different view on clowns and circuses there than we do in America. So it could be... Uh, consider, especially considering that this game was never localized officially... So I think that's more so due to just how poorly the first Edrift game sold and considering how plainly average it was for the series, that's understandable. Uh, as for the as for like the mystery itself in this case, it's it's cool to have uh, the culprit of a previous case become the victim and now you have to solve their murder instead. And uh, having the prison warden as the killer who's always out and about and hounding you like she doesn't there's she's there throughout the entire case and actually makes for a pretty satisfying twist villain i think like <clears throat> not the most subtle of all of them especially in this game but yeah it's again this is probably the least memorable case in the game and considering it's still quite enjoyable i think that says a lot uh yeah. I'm, I'm thinking, I does it go below this or above this? I think I'm going to put it just below. That that seems about right. I do think the twist, uh, having Callisto U and having this setting here is a lot more novel. Even if the gameplay is a lot better in Investigations 2. Because oh, I haven't mentioned it yet, but then the gameplay gets a significant improvement in Investigations 2. Because Logic Chess is just the coolest thing ever. Uh, I said that Cyclops are the best, like, secondary mechanic in the series, and I stand by that, but Logic Chess is probably the second best. It's very, it's just really fun. It's really fun, it's really, uh, high energy, and it does, uh, keep the pace up a lot more than just, like, having to slowly put things together in your head. And, uh, Edra, Hedra having a chess theme has always kind of been present, I believe, like, he's always had chess board in his... In his uh, his, his office, and there's a, and having the and it works well with the, having the knight and rook guys in the first case too. Like there's a very much chess bastard theme to this entire game, which is very fitting considering where this eventually goes. So logic chess fits right in. It feels right at home with Edward's character, and it's just a really fun mechanic. I think it's introduced in the first case, even, but. I'm only just talking about it here because I forgot. Who, who Who is introduced in this case that I forgot to talk about are like the two antagonist characters of this game. So like the, or not antagonists, like arch rivals or anti-heroes. I don't know, nemesis characters, let's call them. Like in the 
Courtney Judge lady whose name escapes me. I'm trying. I'm thinking Courtney Gears, but that's that is the uh, robot pop diva in Ratchet and Clank. That is definitely not the judge in Investigations Two. And then you have Sebastian the Best, who I have named the S tier after because it's really funny, but also because he is a terrible person who's really, really easy to hate. And, and the game kind of wants you to hate him, and I, I, I really respect that, especially considering his later character developments. Like, they, they know this character is annoying. They want you to get annoyed at this character just so they can make you feel bad for getting annoyed at him later. But it also doesn't feel like a twisting of your leg to make that happen. Like, it's not like... It doesn't want to make you feel like the worst ever for hating this character that is obviously meant to be hated. But it's not going to be super kind about it either. He's just, he's just like this arrogant upstart because uh, he's kind of forced into that role by his uh, father. But that's, that's more for... Uh, investigation is 2-4, so I'll touch on that later. There's not much else to say about this one. I've said too much. I've said more than I thought I had to say about this one, actually, but I've mostly been summarizing a lot of what happened in the game here, which, fair enough. Investigations 2-3. This is uh, often considered the crown jewel of the game and the entire series, and one of the, one of the crown jewels of the entire series, and it is the case that officially broke the case 3 curse because in chronological release order this came out between uh investigations one and dual destinies which also has a fairly decent case three but this is this is the one that's like you know how every case three up to this point has been one of the weakest cases in the game uh how about what if case three was one of the best cases in the game maybe even the best case in the game like it's between it's between case 3 and case 5 in this game, but all of these last three cases are incredibly good and will be going incredibly high in this rating. Uh, we'll start actually by putting this right here, I think, right behind 3-4. But for one, this has, this has a novelty factor to it in that you play as Gregory Edgeworth on the case that got him killed <coughs> versus Manfred Von Karma. You get to play the investigation sequence on the case that led to uh, Von Karma's, uh, led to Gregory and Von Karma facing off in court and Von Karma subsequently killing Gregory. You get to play that case and it is every bit as entertaining as you'd expect having <coughs> uh, a younger Ray Shields, who also I have not mentioned to this point, but is a pretty enjoyable character. A younger Ray Shields alongside Gregory Edgeworth and Van Von Karma being his usual absolutely awful, horrible self, just impeding your investigation like the entire segment. But also, this is just straight up one of the best settings in the entire series. I just love this dessert parlor competition <clears throat> where every room you go into is just like a new wonderland to explore and investigate. Like all the chocolate statues, the uh, the like uh, candy castle or whatever, the frozen ice sculptures, the and uh, the blowing the like the blow candy guy, whatever his name is. I don't remember what if he actually has a room or if you actually get to visit it. But like every every single room here has so much personality, as well as like the main court. Also, connecting them all has a lot of personality. And the way they use uh, the Candy Castle and Manfred Von Karma freaking coming out of it as his debut in the case is just so, so good. So, yeah, you, f first you've got uh, this whole sequence, this long investigation sequence of trying to unravel the actual murder and not coming to anything conclusive during that, which is why it has to go to trial. And then you, you cut to... Like, however many years later, 18 years later or something, Edgeworth himself comes back and without having <clears throat> any of the crime scenes and only able, only being able to recreate them using Little Thief and speaking to the much older uh, arrested defendant as well as his much older partner, uh... 
Edward was able to come in and just solve the case that was left unsolved all those years ago. P left, uh, not properly solved, but rather, because uh, the person who got arrested uh, originally that Gregory was going to defend did get uh, a guilty verdict and was spent the entire time since in jail. So basically, you're spending that this case not only solving the murder that got uh, his father killed, but you're also freeing an innocent man who has been locked away in prison for like 18 years at this point on a false conviction. So there's the mystery itself is both really good. The villain is pretty good. Uh, his especially watching his progression between uh, the original scene and then 18 years later, where he goes from fumbling about with his candy molding to just like being an absolute pro at it is uh really satisfying the mystery involving the mystery is also involving like the, there was like clues left in the interim between the original murder and the modern day investigation that helped point to uh the crime which is also really fascinating it's like it's one of the few crimes that's in the series it's like solved over multiple time spans it's got just a lot of weight to it story-wise in terms of its implications, like in terms of what it means catharsis wise for Edgeworth. And it's just got it's just got a lot of great characters, it's got a lot of great settings. Everything about this case is just really, really good. I don't think it has the same level of high drama or ultimate resolution as a lot of the endgame cases that I've put up top above it. And it doesn't have I still don't I still think the ending of 3-4 is so, so, so good. Such a good gut punch that it kind of belongs above anyways but uh now investigations two three is where the game goes from really good to one of the best and it doesn't really let up from there either because we, we go right from that into uh investigations two four which is when i talk about the nerves of the original trilogy like uh that this the nerves of the original trilogy this game being like the fourth game in the original trilogy. This case is like the big reason why. And it's all because of just one guy, Blaze the Best, who is implied to be not only behind uh, this case, the case in this, uh, behind the murder in this case, but behind like all of the forging of evidence, all of the aggressive prosecution, and just like every single thing that happens in the original trilogy in terms of like legal things with Manfred von Karma, Francisca, etc. And just like all rumors of forged evidence, uh, everything ties back to him in some way, shape, or form. And that uh, so long after the fact, he gets uh, one of the most competent victims in the series, uh, her, Jill Crane, I think, I might be getting that wrong who's come so far in investigating him and is like inches away from exposing all his secrets and wrong dealings gets murdered and gets murdered at the last minute but Edward is actually able to based on the murder scene itself based on her investigations uh take everything from that and put together that not not only what Blaze the Best has done in this case with the like evidence auction, which is for one that's a horrifying thought to think of, that they're just selling off uh, evidence from cases like that's completely and totally illegal. But also that, and then, and that every that the building they're in has a secret floor between the top floor and the floor below it where everything is stored and nobody knew somehow. And the fact that also the case starts with uh, Kay almost dying and losing her memory and, and spending the entire case uh, as an amnesiac is also kind of horrifying. Like, I don't know, like there's a lot of, a lot of the details of this case do escape me between, considering it's, it's surrounded by two cases that are better than it, but it's also a very good case on its own merits. Uh, yeah. I don't know, I just, I like this case a lot. I do think, I, I do think, uh, Blaze the Best, 
is one of the better villains in the game. He's probably the best villain in this game, despite not being the final boss. We do get to see a lot in this case, too, uh, Blaze and Sebastian's interactions and showing that uh, Blaze is incredibly abusive to his son and has given him an inferiority complex, which is pretty handily responsible for, like, his terrible, arrogant behavior because he's trying to prove himself to his father who is never going to be satisfied and is never going to be happy and just verbally abuses him no matter what he does. Like, it... It explains his character. It doesn't excuse his character, though. But it makes it does make you feel bad for the best, Sebastian. Uh, especially what happens in Case 2-5 after. Um, yeah, so I do think I do think this is a really good case. Uh, let's see. I want to put it right here, I think. Because I, I do think 3-2's villain is just so, so much better. Like, the, you, you can't go wrong with Luke at me, man. You you can't go wrong with Luke at me. He's he's such a force of personality. I I uh, let's let's see. Uh, so that's two four, and then two f investigations two five. I'm thinking of where to put this. Like if not for the fact that this case is incredibly long, it would instantly go here. I may still be convinced to put it there, but I'm, I'm going to put it here for now. This case... Uh, this case is a lot. <clears throat> this case starts out with a bang. You find out... You see, the murder victim is the president from the first case, who is back for the finale as a dead body. Except he's stuck in what looks like monster tracks. And the, the, I believe, and also, at this, I think on the same breath, uh, Courtney's uh, adopted son, John Marsh. I remember his last name for some reason. I don't remember her last name. <clears throat> Goes missing or something. I forget who is accused of the murder here, actually, originally. It, it kind of becomes irrelevant later on. Yeah, like this. Actually, a lot of the start of this case is a little iffy to me because what happens is what happens later on is a lot more interesting. Like it, it starts with the president uh, being killed, and you, you start investigating from there, trying to piece together what happened. And it turns out that uh, I believe it was actually what happened with the holes themselves was. Uh, Someone, the murderer, was looking for something in particular uh, at the uh, filming site because the filming site was built on top of what used to be an orphanage. And uh, what happened at the time uh, was uh, very interesting events happened at that orphanage where uh, the president... The president of the whatever country it was Zheng Fa, I think that one, yeah, who uh, was just found dead. Turns out that he was assassinated like some 16 years ago at that orphanage and replaced with a body double who's been acting as a president ever since. And it explains why uh, that president is such a coward compared to the image that the actual president projected. And uh, at the time, there were uh, at the orphanage. There, uh, the, this assassination, I think, was I forget who else all was involved. I forget if the best uh, Blaze the Best was involved or not. Maybe some of these, like again, some of these details have been lost in my memory. Uh, but I, I do remember that uh, the murderer in this case was also present at that orphanage along with Knightley. Which is where they met originally, because they were they're the, the sons of the uh, murder victim from Case Three and uh, Dane Gustavia, the culprit, respectively. And then for the longest time, uh, the murderer thinks he is the son of the victim and holds that against Knightley, who he believes is the son of 
Dan Gustavia who committed the killing. Which it turns out in the end is actually the other way around. Which makes for some uh, irony and all that. But also, uh, at the orphanage, he witnesses the presidential assassination, he draws it down, and the assass and the uh, orphanage gets burnt to the ground. And, or not the orphanage itself, I think. Like, something burns on the orphanage, and that's also, like, noted down in his, like, sketch. So he's got... Because of what he's seen, he's got, like, this insider info on everything that happened since with the fake president and Blaze the Best. And from using that info, he's been able to play the role of the chess master, manipulating every single character involved into doing what he wants without getting his hands dirty at all. Like, he manipulates uh, Roland into killing Knightley. He manipulates... Uh, I think he's the one. He think he leaks info to Jill Crane on Blaze the Best. Like I, I could be making all this up. I could be totally wrong. I remember he's like the chess master behind everything in the game, and he's in uh, Dan Gustavia's son. And all this comes to get all this comes to a point at the very big circus of all places, because by the time you have gotten to that point, you have put together that this magical chess master who has been behind everything in this game, has been controlling everything with the shadows and not getting his hand dirty at any point, is Simon Keyes, the defendant of the second case, the timid monkey see, monkey do guy. And all, all along, it's rather than being controlled by his monkeys, he's it turns out he was the one controlling everything without getting his hands dirty, except for at the very last minute where his hot air balloon landed on and killed the fake president. And that was uh, the only culpability he has in the whole affair, which is, again, like, on one hand, he's actually really sympathetic for, considering he's, like, the big bad of the entire game, but also, like, just a master manipulator. Like, I don't, again, I'd, I'd probably have to replay this one, it's been a long time, and the details of it are a bit fuzzier than I'd like them to be, but the ultimate end... The ultimate endgame of this story. Also, there's a kidnapping plot in there too, where Sebastian the Best gets kidnapped by his own father too. Like, there's there's so much going on in this case, it is kind of hard to keep track of all of it. But I all I can remember when I'm thinking about this is this case was just blew my mind when I first played it. When I first played the translation, uh, all those years ago when that first came out. And like I, I I really like the case. I don't think it's as good as the, like those, those top three there, which I don't think anything else is going to get added to that tier, spoiler warning. Uh, but it is really, really good, and definitely one of the most enjoyable cases in the series. And a, a really good capstone to a really good game. Like, the, the worst case in this game is still really good. Uh, and that'll be it for the Investigations games, I think. Like, as a whole, the first, the first game is fine, the second game is really good. It's, it's kind of a shame that the second investigation game is now the only unofficially localized game in the series, considering how important it is to the original trilogy and how just good as a game it is in general. Like, taking what worked about the Edgeware formula, adding in its own new mechanics, adding in its better, more tightly written story that has uh, just the implications that it does. And a lot, a lot of the characters in general, too, are just more interesting than they were in the first game. Again, uh, I do think it still has some of the same issues where everything can be a bit drawn out. And it's not the best written game in the series. I still think Trials and Tribulations overarching plot does more because it has three games worth of material to work with. But it's, it's hard to deny that it's probably like the most... It's like the most solidly good game overall. But while also having some really strong highs that make it an absolute must play. If you, if you've never played Investigations 2, like, why are you so why are you watching this video, by the way? But if you've never played it, it's it's definitely one of the best games. I'm really only skimming the surface of what is like a 30-hour game here, so uh, I'm gonna I'm going to call it for now. But I'm probably going to go right back into recording the next games immediately. But I just I just want to give a like a logical break in the videos here. So, see you next time.